Howdy everybody. In this uh, episode, uh, we're just going to step away from ham radio for just a little bit. Um, found this cool SDR board on eBay, paid about $130 for it. The cool thing about this thing is it goes up to six gigahertz. Yeah. So you can look at stuff in the 5.8 band, um, do a little sniffing around and stuff. Um, but first, uh, I'm going to show it to you on the bench here um, and point out some stuff on the board, uh, stuff that you might not realize. And uh, also, this board works with um, the SDR++ software, a few other things, um, but mainly SDR++. Uh, and so we'll show you that and uh, we'll go hunt around for some 5.8 signals. How that? All right. So stay tuned. Okay, let's look at this board a little bit closer. You'll uh, you'll like this. It's a uh, Ethernet connected to your laptop. What does that mean? Well, that means uh, extremely high bandwidth. Like the uh, RTL SDRs, they only do uh, three megahertz worth of RF bandwidth. That's how much you can look at at one any one time. Um, the uh, the use of the Ethernet um, to communicate to the SDR software means that this board can capture up to 40 megahertz wide of RF information anywhere in the uh, realm of 100 megahertz all the way up to 6 gigahertz. Actually, I think it goes a little bit lower than 100 megahertz, but basically anything between 100 megahertz and 6 gigahertz this we'll see, and it will also be able to capture 40 megahertz wide band uh, or slice, if you will. And you can see all of that on the uh, laptop software. So underneath this heat sink is the zinc processor that's uh, ZYNQ. Um, and underneath this heat sink over here is the uh, analog to digital um, converter or A to D. Um, this one is the A to D, or sorry, AD9363, I believe. Uh, I'm going to have to check that. But uh, the cool thing about this is it has uh, two RF ins and two RF outs, uh, meaning this board can TX. It's very low. It's like maybe a milliwatt. Um, but there is software that allow you to create a waveform and then get this thing to transmit on either one of these outs. So dual inputs, dual outputs, um, and it connects via Ethernet um, and requires a USB-C uh, for power, um, has an SD flash card for its internal firmware, you can download the firmware and burn it onto this uh, SD card. Um, and uh, I added an extra little fan. This fan sits here with, um, with these uh, standoffs. Created a little standoff setup so that the, uh, the fan just kind of floats above the board. It's not really necessary, but uh, it does help with cooling. And this back shell I found um, scrap metal and just kind of like cut it to the shape that would fit the board. Uh, kind of made um, little notches here for each one of the SMAs. But basically that's the board. Um, again, this is $130 uh, through eBay. Uh, and uh, you have to wait a few days for it to come because I think it comes from uh, China. So uh, it's a great little SDR, uh, and uh, we're going to get to play with it right about now. Okay, just a quick explanation of what's going on here. We have the uh, SDR, and uh, currently have a single antenna connected to one of the antenna inputs. Uh, that's this antenna right here, which is just a broadband Yagi antenna. Uh, this one goes from uh, 1 gigahertz to 9 gigahertz and uh, you can get these on uh, eBay or Amazon they're about um, I say 9 or 10 dollars maybe 12 dollars are really uh, simple 
So we have this thin blue coax connection here on the back that's a SMA and then it goes back over to here. Uh, we are currently connected with Ethernet cable to the laptop. Uh, the uh, device automatically creates its own IP address uh, for which you configure the software for. In the software it will show up as Pluto SDR, like Pluto the planet, and then Sierra Delta Romeo. Um, that's just the kind of firmware image that's installed into this unit. It uh, sets itself up like the um, uh, analog devices Pluto SDR if you're familiar with that. So uh, again, this unit is maybe $130 off of uh, uh, eBay, um, and uh, it's really interesting. Uh, currently, right now on the screen, I'm showing uh, 915 megahertz, roughly in around there. And uh, you can see a lot of uh, frequency hopping radios out there. This tends to be all the uh, smart meters. Uh, our neighborhood is full of smart meters, and so what you're seeing is the uh, um, RF output from all those smart meters. And there's probably other devices too that are in the 900 megahertz range, um, but that's that's the main main kind or the main stuff that you're going to see. Um, <clears throat> I mean, they they show as little pulses. Uh, pseudo random kind of jumping around in the spectrum between 902 and 928. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go up quite high. I'm going to go up to 3875 just to show you something. Uh, let's get there. 3875. Stuff along those lines. So now it says. 3.875 gigahertz up at the top. <clears throat> I'm going to slide this around a little bit till uh, we can see something interesting. Okay, so what you're seeing here is so, sort of a um, CDMA type modulation. You'll see blocks of frequency spectrum being used either as a single block or multiple blocks combined. And uh, you can really make it out sometimes in the, uh, in the waterfall. Uh, you'll, you can just see in this waterfall a very faint delineation between this frequency block and this frequency block. And a block looks like it's five megahertz wide. So that's a five megahertz chunk of spectrum that's being used for for whatever, I'm not even too sure what's that 3.8 gig, but something is out here in my neighborhood with a fairly strong signal. I'm getting a neg 80 on that last b burst. Um, so at 3.86 gigahertz, we're seeing resource blocks being used at specific times, obviously. The, uh, the tower or whatever is in control of um, allocating both frequency resource um, uh, sections or segments and time resource. You know, when, when the subscriber or whatever handset is being used at that time, it, the, a, a map for the next you know, 40 or 80 microseconds is sent to the subscriber, all the subscribers that are on that tower and <clears throat> it allocates, the mapping allocates when you're allowed to transmit as the subscriber unit and what frequency chunk I want you to transmit at. So that's kind of how CDMA works and also WiMAX and um, uh, LTE cellular. Uh, every, on the control channels, every 40 or 80 microseconds, uh, a resource block map is sent to all the subscribers that are associated with that tower telling them what blocks, how much, one resource, two resource, five resources wide, and how much time uh, they're allotted depending on if they're downloading a file or they're just watching a video or checking email. It kind of determines bandwidth requirements and assigns periodically a resource map out to everyone.
So anyway, <clears throat> what we're seeing here is something in 3.8. Now I'm going to jump up a little bit here. I'm going to go up to uh, 5.7, which is usually the area. <clears throat> sorry, usually the area for Wi-Fi. And uh, in my neighborhood, or it's just because of range issues, I'm not seeing a lot going on in the 5.7 gig area. So I'm just gonna scroll down. Uh, I, there's a, a peak here, but I think it's just a birdie. Um, don't really think that's a real signal. Um, and still sc scrolling by. I don't know if you can see these blue markers, but I implemented those with an XML file within SDR++. And you can title it. Uh, this one seems, says 802.11a channel 157. So if there was a Wi-Fi transmitter using channel 157, we would kind of see it in here as a hump. <clears throat> And uh, we're currently at 5.78 gig. Right here in this region is 5.8 gigahertz. Uh, still not seeing much. Uh, and up here we're at 5.82 gigahertz. So this becomes in handy when you want to see if there's a 5.8 gigahertz radio transmitter that's causing you interference. Um, it could be like a um, somebody else's Wi-Fi. It could be another user of the 5.8 band, but this is generally helpful. Uh, this antenna usually works pretty good in that frequency range. I mean, this is good up to 10 gigahertz, the, uh, the Yagi antenna. But um, yeah, so let's drop down to uh, 2.4 where I know there's 2.4 stuff because my house has 2.4 equipment and uh, we'll see if we can ah okay so uh, this is 2.424 and that is channel 6 uh, in the 802.11 2.4 band channel 6 is here uh, it looks like there's somebody else on 2.4 1 to 6 and that would probably be channel three. There, there is some overlap because you, you have three overlaps, four, five overlaps. Yes, four overlaps, three, five overlaps, four and six overlaps, five, but just slightly. Um, if you get two stations or two radio systems that are right next to each other, it can cause problems. So normally people use channel one, channel six, and channel 11 because it gives you that extra buffer of maybe probably 20 megahertz between uh, uh, usages of, of that spectrum. But uh, yeah, you can definitely see it very well uh, in here, the, uh, the 2.4 users. There's an, another one up here, uh, another 2.4 band user so there's a lot of activity going on apparently uh, but anyway I wanted you guys to see the um, the SDR and uh, uh, maybe you'll go and experiment on your own I'm running uh, Ubuntu Linux this is Ubuntu 2204 ish it's it's kind of a derivative um, it's called pop OS but it's basically the guts of it is Ubuntu 2.4 or Ubuntu 22.04, sorry. And um, this is SDR++ version 1.2.1. Um, and it, uh, it automatically detects uh, the SDR as a potential source for um, the uh, waveform information or I and Q data, if you will. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it makes it a very simple spectrum analyzer that goes up to roughly six gigahertz, um, along with a cheap e antenna. I mean, you can find better Yagis than this, but for eight, nine dollars, th this PC board antenna is perfect for just sniffing the uh, frequencies above 2.4.
All right, there you have it. I hope that was fun.